Why? Because the prince and the power of the air has blinded their eyes and has dulled the senses of the alarm, so they become incensed to the alarm. It's not that they don't hear, it's not that they don't recognize, but they become incensed to it. Church, this is not the time for us to be incensed or to become uh, take for granted the alarms that are given to us in the word. But now is the time to sound the alarm even louder, to do whatever it takes to make sure that not only we are ready, but that we're doing whatever it takes to spread this gospel. Because there are those who are dying and lost. Amen. And that's what brings me to the second part of this revelation. Yes. For as I said, I, I made up the nice list of all the things I would do if I were to die tomorrow. There's some, some great things on there. I said it would, you know, write my story of what the Lord has done for me and in my family. And I would invite all uh, my friends and have just a, a big gathering just to, just to celebrate life. Amen. And so I thought that was a pretty nice list. And so, you know, I went about trying to, trying to look at this list and find ways to bring this about. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as we do sometimes, I put the list aside and didn't look at it so long. I'm still thinking about dying daily, still trying to face death on the regular. But as I was going, I was uh, planning because, you see, there was a, a music conference that I wanted to go to. But this wasn't just any music conference. This is not just any music conference. If, if, if you know me, you know that uh, I have a younger brother who I just love more than... You know, as if he was my own son sometimes. My mother always said I was like a second mother to him, you know, because there's such a disparity in age. And... For my brother, he wrote a song that the Lord gave him, a song called Send Up Praise, and he, uh, he allowed me to hear it, and at this conference was going to be the premiere, the world premiere of this song. And so he was saying, you're coming to the conference, right? I'm like, of course I'm going to be there. You know, Big Sis, he calls me Big Sis, big, you know, big Sis is going to be there, you know, to support you, right in the front row. And so I was plotting and planning and found a, and I'm going somewhere with this, so here we go this morning. You know, I found uh, a nice flight from Burlington, you know, a reasonable price. I said, yes, next pay, I'm going to buy that ticket. I'm going to be there in St. Louis. The conference was just this weekend. I said, I'm going to be there to support my brother. But as it happens, especially that this was spring break, by the time I went back to purchase the ticket, the price had more than doubled. And so I'm looking at my check, and I'm looking at the price, and I'm saying, something, yeah, something, something, something doesn't work out. Something's not right here. Something's not matching up. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a gap here. And you know, the, the airlines are not like God. They don't uh, extend mercy to you if you can't pay for it. <laughs> but when I saw this, I started to plot and plan, you know, trying to stay calm, cool, collected, be like, you know, if it's the Lord's will, he'll make a way for me to go. You know, we, we pull out these scriptures sometimes. We try to apply it to our situation. Again. If it's the Lord's will, how could it not be the Lord's will for me to be there for my brother? Of course it's the Lord's will. So the Lord will make a way. So while I'm saying the Lord will make a way, Nicole's trying to find another her own way. I'm, you know, looking up Greyhound buses. I'm saying, okay, well, if I take the bus to New York, then I can get a rental car, go fly there from Chicago, then drive from Chicago to St. Louis as a three-hour driver. I mean, and I'm trying to find every possible way to get there. Why? Because I love my brother. And he said, you know, for him, this was important. It was important for me to be there. It's important for his family to be there, to see, you know, especially knowing the path that he's taken to get to the place where the Lord is using him in such a mighty way. You know, when he, when he was playing basketball in high school, you know, he was uh, one of the top players, and I, you know, make sure I drove all the way, you know, from school to come see him. Why? Because it was important. So how much more he's doing the work for the Lord? And I, I tried to justify it. And so I'm in my office late one Thursday night, and I'm finding, I'm looking for flights, and I'm looking for what, uh, you know, to find a way to get there. And so as I'm, and like I said, when you're by yourself, it's, it's a great opportunity to be able to speak to yourself and speak out loud, you know, not worrying about what other people have to say. And so I'm looking and I'm searching, and all of a sudden the, a voice just popped in my head and said, why are, you, why are you breaking your head trying to get there? Why is it so important? And I answered out loud and said, oh, it's my brother. I love him. Of course. Of course. I do anything for him. And the voice said, oh, really? You must really love your brother if you're willing to do whatever it takes to help out and to be there. And I'm like, yeah, of course I do. The Lord answered back, when's the last time you tried to do that for me? Mm. Yeah. Silence. You know, when the Lord is, I love the Lord, but when he speaks, he convicts. He doesn't condemn and make you feel like, oh my God, I'm such a horrible person. He isolates that thing that you need to work on. He pinpoints and says, mm. Here's a problem. Mm -hmm. Here's something that we need to work on. That's right. Here's something that needs to be fixed. Man. Here's something that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And so he said, when's the last time you went out of your way and did whatever it took to do something for me? Mm -hmm. And I was silent because I, I had nothing to say. Mm -hmm. 
Because I profess, Lord, I love you. We come and we sing these songs on Sunday mornings. And Lord, I love you and I worship you. I give my life. I surrender my all to you. And we sing these songs and they sound so nice. Mm, they do sound nice. But what does it mean to really love? What does it mean to really love? And so the Lord continued. That, that wasn't the end of it. He said, you know, and you love your brother. It's clear that you do. But you also say that every man is your brother. Mm -hmm. So if every man is your brother, why aren't you going out of your way and doing whatever it takes to be able to minister and to be there for your brother? Mm -hmm. Double couch. Mm -hmm. Silence. Why? Because I have nothing to say. Because you see, there's a difference between the profession of our mouths and the intent of the heart. And sometimes we say things meaning well and, and really believing what we say. But as we mentioned, actions speak louder than words. That's right. And as we uh, are studying in the book of Romans, you know, after I had this revelation, um, Sister Nicole and I were reading in the book of Romans. And Paul starts to talk about in the 11th chapter about the profession of our mouths. But he says something interesting. You see, Paul wasn't just talking about the profession of one's mouth. But he said that if you believe in your heart the Lord Jesus Christ and confess with your mouth, the same shall be saved. So in other words, there's a twofold meaning. There's a twofold uh, uh, requirement here. For we have many that confess with their mouths, but it's not everyone that believes in their heart. And you may ask, how, how do you know the difference? How can you tell the difference? Well, the difference is in the action. Yes. The difference is in the behavior. The difference is how we actually walk. For we say it all the time, but it's so true. Actions speak louder than words. We can say whatever we want, and we can say who we are and profess to be these great people. But unless our actions back up what we say, then we have no credibility. I want to draw an example for you, for we were talking about this in our, in our study. We started to look at Acts. We said, okay, well, what is it? How can we really have a confession? You know, if, if, if the confession comes from the heart, then can you really have a confession and not believe? And so we started to look in the scripture, and we came to Acts chapter 5. And we saw that, actually, it starts in Acts chapter 4. We see, in, starting with verse 32, and I'm going to read it for you this morning, Acts chapter 4, starting with verse 32, you can read along. It says, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Amen. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the price of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distributed, distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostle was named Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite and of the country of Cyprus, having land sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Yeah. But the story goes on in chapter 5. It says, But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? and to keep back part of the price of the land. While it remained, it was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And as we go on the story, we see the repercussions of lying to God. And we see that Ananias drops dead, and so does his wife as she comes in later on, not knowing what happened to her husband. But what I want us to see in this passage is what drove the people to do what they did. See, the very first verse that we read in verse 32, it says, And the multitude of them that believed. In other words, belief 
was what caused the multitude to give of themselves. They believed, they heard the gospel preached, and they believed it. Not just, they didn't just confess that they believed it, but they believed it in their heart. And we know that they believed because their actions spoke to the belief that was hidden. See, we can't see people's actual belief. But what we see is the action that drives them to accomplish what it is that they believe or what they've received or what, they, that what they've been turned in themselves. With the woman with the issue of blood, she believed that if she just touched the hem of her garment, then she would be made whole. And so she threw away protocol. She was a woman who had an issue of blood, and so she was deemed unclean. So she had no business by those days' standards of being in the crowd. She had no business in being amongst people. But she pushed protocol aside. She said, you know what, there's a greater need. And I know, I believe that if I can just touch yeah. the hem of his garment. So she, she crawled through the crowd on her hands and knees and pushed people aside. People who, you know, un unknowingly stepped on her, not knowing she was there. saying, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who steps on me. It doesn't matter who, who spits on me. It doesn't matter what happens. I must touch Jesus. That's right. Yes. Why? Because she believed. Yes. And it was that belief, that faith that drove her. Yes. It was that belief that compelled her and propelled her forward. Yes. It was her belief that, that, that pushed her past the protocol, past the norms of society to get to Jesus and right. to touch him. Right, right, right. We can see her faith. The, the Lord turns back to her and said, who touched me? Right. And when he sees the woman, he says, thy faith yes. has made you whole. It's your faith, that, that very thing that propelled you to, to get past everything, to get past all the obstacles that stood in your way. It's that faith that made you whole. Praise them. And it's that same faith that these, the multitude believed after they had heard the word preached. They believed and that compelled them to act. Yes. For see, when you believe, belief ought to compel you to act. That's right. If I say, everybody watch out, this house is on fire. If you believe, you're, you're running for the door. That's right. But if you don't believe, then you kind of look at me, oh yeah, I believe you, I believe you. And you kind of maybe take your time and you know, look for your lip gloss and you know, find something. But if you believe, your belief ought to push you to action. That's right. The people that we read of in the book of Acts, they believed and that was that belief that caused them to sell everything that they had. That's right. Because they believed that if they sold all, everybody would have meat. Nothing, nothing. They didn't hold on to anything for themselves. They didn't have that selfish attitude to say, well, you know what? You know, you guys can sell all, but I'm going to hold on. Why? Because they believed what was being preached. That's right. Notice no one told them they had to sell everything. Right. That's right. No one commanded them to say, listen, if you want to be in this church, you've got to get rid of everything. Mm -hmm. But because of their belief, they gave all. And we see because they gave all, everybody had meat. That means no one was left out. That's right. Everybody had what they need. Yes. But the Bible goes on to specify about Barnabas. See, we, we learned a little bit about uh, Barnabas in Sunday school uh, a few weeks ago. We learned that his name means son of consolation. He was a mentor. In other words, he was one who believed in this gospel. He was one who, who uh, uh, trained others and, and encouraged them in the way. But in order to be able to encourage them, he had to first believe. Right. And in order for him to first, and, and that belief is what caused him. You know, the reason that the apostles were able to see that Barnabas could be a good mentor is because he demonstrated. His faith was obvious. And we see in this little snippet here, not too much that we learn about him, but what we learn is important is that we see that he had land and he sold it and he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Right. But now the Bible goes on to give a contrast. See, just as Barnabas sold his land and gave, Ananias also sold and his wife also yes. sold. But see, the difference is the intention. The difference is the purpose behind it. That's right. See, Barnabas sold because he believed. He believed and so he sold all like everyone else mm -hmm. and gave to contribute to this great work, this great work that he believed in. But Ananias and Sapphira didn't have that same belief. Mm -hmm. How can we say with confidence that they didn't believe? Because we see that they gave. We see that they took some of what they have and they gave it and laid it at the apostles' feet. That's right. But we see that there was intention behind it. For the Bible tells us that he sold a possession, but he kept back part of the price. 
And so he conspired with his wife to say, listen, we, we want to be like everybody else. You know, everybody else is selling all. We don't want to be the only ones not, not putting in the pot. But you know what? I don't, I don't know about this whole selling all business. I don't know about this. I don't know about surrendering all and giving everything up. You know, I, I kind of like want to hold on to peace for myself. Right. 